Okay, great. <clears throat> Okay, everyone, uh, this is a presentation. Uh, we're going to go over the artificial intelligence that we have at Unity. My name is Chris Harden, and uh, just a little bit about me. I have a little over 23 years of experience in software development. Uh, that's in gaming, simulation, theme parks, um, embedded development, and IoT devices. And I've worked for Unity, and EA Sports, and Disney, and Amazon, and Ford, and a, um, a company called Disney in the um, in the military space. I've had uh, four startups and one of those was able to go on Shark Tank. I am an electrical engineer with an MBA and I have a few books that I've published on entrepreneurship and management and you can learn more about me here. Uh, feel free, please uh, link in with me. I've always enjoyed meeting new people on LinkedIn. So um, my team is a sub team of the artificial intelligence group. So uh, we have a pretty large organization for artificial intelligence, and we're going to go on the, the, the right-hand side here in orange. You guys already know about Core Unity and the IDE and that kind of stuff. Our organization is over here on the right-hand side under AI. And uh, this gentleman here is, is Danny Lang. He is a thought leader in artificial intelligence and has been for many years. He's helped establish AI at Microsoft and Amazon, Uber as well. And if you want to follow anyone who talks about this space with great credibility, it's him. So there's his LinkedIn address right there. Our mission for AI is to democratize AI for Unity developers. So uh, you guys may be familiar with the fact that Unity is trying to democratize many things. One, of course, has been the actual development of games, and they've obviously done that really well. Our goal is to basically make it easier to use AI for anyone using Unity and not have to have as many engineering resources to do it, to save time. So uh, the way we execute on that is we have three pieces to the organization. We have the runtime products that go into Unity or it comes as packages, cloud services, which you'll see about those in a moment for scaling, and then the professional services, which is my team. Our team essentially helps companies transition onto AI because some of the products aren't there yet. A lot of people don't know how to use AI that well. So they will enlist our services to ease themselves onto the AI platform. And as John mentioned, we're in Orlando. So today, I'm going to show you a big picture of Unity AI. So um, at the high level, I'm going to show you some basics of AI, just to be sure we're all talking the same language. And then I'm going to give you some example use cases here which I think will help to codify some of the value that AI brings that you may not be aware of. And then we'll talk about the technologies that AI is offering. And we're also gonna look at ML agents specifically with hummingbirds. You guys may or may not be familiar with that, but it's an excellent example of what you can do uh, with ML agents. Okay, so at a high level, just kind of look at some common examples of AI you may or may not be aware of. When you're in Gmail and some other um, texting Type applications, if you get auto text me on the end, that's AI. It's autofill, and it seems to be getting better every few months. You're hopefully aware of the AI behind Alexa and Siri and Google Home and Cortana. That's all natural language processing. Clearly, it's a big investment by those major players. And, of course, the poster child, I think, for AI is autonomous vehicles. You can't really have a self-driving car unless it has artificial intelligence. But you might not be aware of something like document processing. This is a multi-billion dollar industry here where companies have uh, basically carved out their stake in processing documents much more quick, quickly with AI uh, than they have in the past with humans. And a great example is that as a customer, a company out of Atlanta who um, helped to process hundreds of thousands of applications for the coronavirus uh, monies that were shared from the government, making sure that the documents were properly filled out, that documents were sent that weren't needed, that pushed those back, that kind of thing. So that, that's huge. But it's kind of a not a really sexy or interesting use of it. And lastly, if you haven't heard of the Amazon Go stores, this is really cool. It's their retail play. But if you notice, there's no workers in this little building here. That's because it's all driven by AI with sensors that when you pick up the food, it knows you pick up the food. When you walk in, it knows who you are. And you just basically pick it up and leave. So wonderful um, uses there. And then there's a slide in this deck, which you'll get. I'll, you guys can share later. Uh, a bunch of other different uses. You're welcome to look at these links down here to see uh, other uses that you might not have thought of. Some of them that come to mind that I find interesting are the um, social media ones, because you know, there's a lot of social media monitoring going on to be sure that 
things are appropriate in social media, chat bots when you go to a website and says, hi, how can I help you? And that kind of stuff. So that's just some examples. Now what I'm gonna do is go down a certain route of artificial intelligence that we, that we wanna do here during this presentation. So at the top we have artificial intelligence. And then one artificial intelligence you might be aware of is called scripted AI. And that's sort of what's been done in video games for many, many years now. Basically, it's a large if-else tree, a switch of decisions in a certain context. When I was helping to build and ship the NBA game from EA Sports, we had AI engineers sitting there coding up how the um, non-controllable characters would play, how those agents would play. So that's a very strong and historical way of using it. It's still very popular, of course, natural language processing. Um, as we go over here to the right, the things that we're really working in in our space are machine learning and also game simulation. We have an offering there where if you want to um, basically ensure that your game is, is fun as much as possible, you can run thousands of simulations and level the game so that it's not too hard to play, it's not too easy to beat. So that's a big, big offering that we make. I'm gonna kind of wind down into the machine learning area here. There's three major areas of machine learning. One is supervised learning, which is for classifying things. So if you feed, 500 pictures of your child and 500 pictures of, of your dog to a, a, a supervised learning um, app, and then you show it new pictures, it can do a pretty good job of figuring out which one's the child and which one's the dog. <coughs> That's called classifying, and you're labeling things there. But there's also the ability to do unsupervised learning, and that's where you give large amounts of data to um, the algorithm, and it identifies patterns or clusters in the data. It can surface things. And because of those patterns, you don't, you're not telling it what it is. It says, hey, I see these major areas coming up. So it's a different kind of uh, learning. And then reinforcement learning, very powerful in what we do <clears throat> at Unity. It's related to the machine learning agents that we'll talk about later today. This is reward driven. And a cute little example here you can check out online. This link is called Snoopy Pop. Um, Jam City did this. Basically, it runs this simulation really fast. And Snoopy is rewarded for when he makes successful pops. And he has some sort of um, negative reward if he's not doing the right thing. And over a while of many, many loops, Snoopy learns how to play the game automatically. And that's kind of the principle behind ML agents as well. The main, you might hear a part of deep learning. The thing about deep learning is it takes a lot and a lot of data. And that's really when you start getting into more human simulated kind of work. Um, you need lots of data to pull this off when it's ridiculously complicated. So deep learning is also something we support. And this is my little call out box over here. The way you make all of this really savvy is with lots of iterations and lots of data. And we're gonna see how that works. So I'm gonna give you a value chain. We have a bunch of different stuff that we offer into the marketplace, uh, but it can be a little overwhelming to understand where things fit. So I'm gonna show you a value chain for something called sensor fusion. <clears throat> sensor fusion sounds really cool because it has the word fusion in it, but what it essentially is is you're taking two sensors like a LIDAR and a camera or something, and you're taking that information together, potentially laying some artificial intelligence on top of it. It also could be human intelligence, and you're coming out with some predictors that have a higher probability of success than you could have if uh, you were just using one kind of sensor. And so we're gonna show that down here. There's a couple of things going on here. One is this is a real world scenario. So you are um, taking your LIDAR sensor in this case, it could be a camera or something like that, LiDAR is used on autonomous vehicles to scan. It's used by robots to scan the environment, basically like a laser going around in a circle and understand what it's doing. So in the real world, you'd have you know, the car sitting in a, in a street or a robot sitting in a manufacturing place or a warehouse and they're spinning their LiDAR around. And then they're using some savvy here, some computer vision, perception processing, or something called semantic segmentation, which I'll show you on the next slide. And that information can go to do data processing which could lead to reports, visualization, like some of the little charts up here. The one on the left is a home security system that says, hey, your, you know, your, your, your door's open in your house. It's not really a great system, but we all know that system, those systems well. Um, and on the bottom, it could go to an algorithm, a fusion algorithm, where it's trying to learn something about that. This is gonna lead to a poorly trained model, and you're gonna see this model get better and better as we go through these slides, because it has a low amount of data and there's not a whole lot of learning it can do with just one sensor. So the next step we do is we first off add some more sensors over here. So on the left-hand side, 
we got uh, not only LIDAR, but we also have a regular camera and infrared, which will give us depth. We run those through perception processing as well. And just as a sidebar, up here is a collection of files, collection of images. And if you guys are familiar with this look and feel, it is essentially the output of processing that's looking at a street. And the, the, the algorithm has identified a car and people and a sidewalk and a street. It's got trees up there. So this is called semantic segmentation. It's labeling all these things as a certain category of element. So that's all well and good. And you can take this information and with more sensors, you can make a more mature guess at what's going on. And then you can process that data and start to sit up here. You might say that's kind of handy, but what's a good application? Imagine if you have combinations of sensors like this in a, where, in a, um, I don't know, a school or uh, an office building. Instead of just the sensor system just saying, hey, the door's open, it can say, um, I think I see a burglar. I don't think I see the, the people that normally are here. I don't see an animal that looks like a burglar. You have a much more savvy prediction as to what's going on in that building with something like this. Uh, you can also get much more mature data prediction analytics out of it if you're pulling in sensors from like satellite data or, or if you're looking at social media and you're pulling in a bunch of social media data, you have a much more mature look at what all's going on in the world and you can make better predictions that might just be visualized. But of course you have the option not just to visualize the data for humans to look at, but also to fuse that together with machine learning algorithms. And then you're still gonna have kind of a poorly trained inference model, mainly because you're dealing with real world data. Remember, this is still real world up here. Okay, so I'm gonna go a little further now. And instead, oh, let's talk about why, why it's a problem. It's expensive. The reason why it's expensive, because let's say you want to go out and capture a bunch of data from a real, real world environment. Maybe you have to go take pictures of an airplane or take pictures of a street. You have to travel to go get it. You have to put someone on the project to go get it. Um, and they have to look at it from night to day, when it's raining, when it's snowing, when it's foggy, all the stuff that you would want to capture just may not be available or you may have to spend a lot of time doing it in order to get all that real world data. And then if you try to use the results of that, it's risky in some scenarios and you can end up getting someone hurt because the, the model isn't trained really well. And so this whole, this whole conversation right here about insufficient data in the real world, that's a big problem because, and that's what makes it so expensive. And we have solutions for that. And then finally, it's time consuming. So here's what we do. Instead of doing it in real world, we create a synthetic environment. This is where Unity comes in. It is a synthetic environment. So now I've, I've in, in enveloped this here in a little blue dotted line to indicate that it's the Unity environment. You guys are all familiar with the Unity 3D runtime. And also, of course, obviously models in the environment. So now, let's say you wanted to, to add, apply some AI to uh, model detection of a plane or a bus or a car or, or buildings or whatever. You can model the environment that it's supposed to be in and put the actual item in there itself and do a lot of iteration. And then you can also emulate these sensors. They can all still work in the Unity environment with really powerful accuracy. And you can even do things like make the camera dirty so that you get closer to reality. <clears throat> so again, they go through all the processing and they can generate a ton of imagery from what? Well, you can, you can actually do it from a bunch of different angles. We actually have a little reset scenario here that comes in and you move the sensors around. So now, whereas you would have had a photographer walking around taking pictures all day long, as many angles as he or she could get, you can have the, candom, the camera and the other sensors just randomly move through the environment as needed and capture all that data at insane, uh, insane speeds. So this little white arrow I'm going to keep is going to, is going to communicate that training loop. It's going to go back around and do it again and again and again and again. Thousands and thousands of, of loops you can go through here to train this little algorithm that's sitting over here in this box. All right, right there. Okay, so then we can get even better. So now you know you can move, you can model the environment, get thousands of iterations, but how do you make it even more powerful? They have, we have this thing called automatic domain randomization. And this isn't just Unity, these are general concepts here. What you do is you change the cameras, like I said earlier, or the sensors, you change the lighting. So instead of just having it be, you know, the office has some light coming in from the ceiling, it can have different versions of lighting. It can have the sun being outside. Is it the sun during the winter when it's further away from the earth or in the, in the summer when it's closer at these different angles? Is it rainy? Is it foggy? Is it snowing? Um, all the kind of things you could do uh, and I'll show you a wonderful animation here in a little while that kind of paints this for us. 
as well as textures on the items themselves, which is a big part of, of helping the algorithm over here look past the textures. So imagine if you have a, a delivery truck. Is it UPS? Is it Amazon? Is it FedEx? Is it DHL? Well, we can randomize all the textures in there so that the algorithm learns to ignore that stuff and still recognize the truck in its environment. So that's really huge in adding some savvy to the model. But it even gets more interesting. So we can also do what's called synthetic data generation. And what they do there is, there's a little picture over here, super cool. They will generate those items. You can take that same item, and we have a wonderful example, cereal boxes, you can look it up online. And, um, and it generates it at all tons of angles. So that no matter what angle you're looking at, like say with your augmented reality application, when you're trying to lock into something in the hallway or something on the store shelf, it will get it. Right now, that's really difficult to do unless you can do a lot of synthetic data generation. And so then behind the, the items that you're actually trying to get, there's a, just a noisy background with wonderful textures and, and shapes and all sorts of stuff that will train the model to disregard that. And there's also the ability to do occlusion, which is items in front of the stuff you're trying to detect. The interesting thing here is imagine if you do have a security system in your house and you want the security system to uh, identify things in the house, but not throw false alarms. And let's say you have a dog. Well, if the dog is you know, halfway behind the couch, your, your AI is tracking that needs to recognize, oh yeah, that's still the dog, don't throw the alarm. Only do it when it's necessary. So occlusion is a big part of making these models even more savvy right here. So with a system like this, you can, you can iterate random locations, random textures, random everything here thousands and thousands of times and really mature the model that will come out on top. And you have a well-trained inference model that you can use for real world devices or apps. It just depends on what you need. And the result is you have a high probability of success on those choices or recommendations. Now, we have, as you guys can imagine, the full vision on this, and we have modules that go into each thing. Okay, so um, we have obviously the runtime in the models. You can, you, your customers can use that, you guys can build your models in there. We have something called Unity Sensor SDK for all the sensor emulation. It's still in progress, we have a, a roadmap there. Uh, Unity Perception SDK is for processing all that stuff, doing that labeling and segmentation I mentioned to you earlier with all the colors and, and categories. We certainly have Unity ML agents. Um, we also have the ability to do the ADR, which is that domain randomization with lighting, all that stuff, and synthesis of, the, of data. So this whole mature system can run and give you a well-trained model. So in that case, it is better, better than real world data, and it's cheaper because you can do it all in the computer very quickly. You don't have to travel and all that kind of stuff. Let's take a moment though and look at what the next steps are. What about faster? Can you get all three in the, in the, in the uh, project triangle, the iron triangle, if you guys know it's faster, better, cheaper, you can almost always pick two. I actually think we can pick three because this is disruptive technology here. So in this scenario, what we've done is I've taken that diagram, just pick one of these little squares here. That's the same diagram. And you scale it on a cloud-based simulation. If you guys are familiar with Kubernetes clusters and uh, containerized apps, that's a possibility you do that. And now you don't have to use one computer for hours or days or weeks to do a simulation and train the model. You push it up to the cloud and this simulation engine will in fact do that for you. And I think this little, this in the way, let's see if I can move that on. I can't move that little controller. So um, it will do that for you. Now we have, of course, as you can imagine, Unity Simulation handles that. There's also the ability to do remote configuration on it so you can tweak parameters and run it again. So the iteration time becomes really small and what would have taken a developer a month or a week to run and sim, you can do an hours or even you know, an hour depending on what it is you're simulating. So now it's faster, it's, it's better, it's cheaper, and it's faster to do this. This is why AI simulation and training is so powerful and so disruptive. Okay, so that's a really detailed look at a value chain. I, I built it up, love to hear questions from you on that. But before we go to the, and I'll maybe open up a question for you, hummingbirds. But let me show you some other ones so you can kind of see how this applies in other contexts. Okay, so here's one with robotics. So if you put the trained inference model, it's a little file, by the way. We'll see that when we do hummingbirds. This is just a file. It's, a, it's basically a binary, a text file that it spits out. And you can take that. 
We are actually integrating with the robot operating system, which is very common for these kinds of solutions, and allows you to take that inference file, which is what it's called, the decision file, the neural network file, and shove it into human-like robots, pick and place robots who do welding, that kind of stuff, or even into sled robots over here. So there's a real world scenario where these robots can be so much more accurate when they're trained with a synthetic solution that scales. So here's a wonderful example. I love this one because it really paints the power of what you can do when you have all those tools at hand. On the left, and so on the bottom, by the way, is the, syn the synthetic environment diagram I showed you earlier. I just kind of stretched it out because I want to show you these pictures up here. On the left-hand side, we have a warehouse. In there, you're seeing, first off, the lights. The lights that are on the ceiling flicker on and off. And also, there's also some sunlight coming in from the ceiling. It is also adding textures to the floor for different rug mappings, because these rugs have mean something to the, to the people putting the stuff together. <coughs> and we're also th synthesizing data right there. And that will be the scaffolding. That will be the, um, the boxes. And those are also getting textures applied to them. So here's a wonderful uh, combination of all, synth all the synthetic data and ADR. The next part is the sensor SDK at work. It's emulating the camera. And they actually have a little sled robot going through this environment, which is over here on the left, and it's driving. And you can see its point of view as it's seeing the stuff flicker and all the stuff is changing. Over here on the next slide is the perception SDK at work, where it is doing the, um, the semantic segmentation. It says, that's a box, that's a scaffold, this is the floor. Don't go on the green part right there on the floor. That's the savvy that that brings. It all goes into the ML agents and it loops around and around and around and around, thousands of iteration, trains up this model. And then that thing gets shoved into sled robots like what you see here in this warehouse. Now I'm going to show you a, a simulation that does not have ML agents because you don't have to have ML agents. You don't have to be making those decisions. It can just be that you want a fast way to get a simulation run and get some statistics and some data. <clears throat> you guys might have seen this one. This is the coronavirus spread in a grocery store project. And it was done in, in cohort with the uh, the um, IDM Institute for Disease Modeling. There's a white paper out there, and there's also a demo that you can see. So uh, what this is, is here's the unit environment. We're looking down on top of the retail store. And over on this side, we have the parameters in this little box. All the parameters you could possibly set. This is remote parameterization. I mean, it's parameterization in the app, but you'll see some remote work too. And then the scenarios here are created by however you want to set up your scenario with these little sliders. Number of shoppers coming in, open registers. Do we use one-way aisles or not? That's a little checkbox to turn on one-way aisles, if you guys remember when the retailers were doing that. The number of people infected at the beginning, checkout times, and other tuning parameters here. And now at the bottom, here's the real value, is what happens to the people who got sick. How many people got sick <clears throat> with that? So I, I tapped it early, but I'll go ahead and run this. This is a video here. Can you guys see the video okay? Zarela, can you give me a thumbs up? Great. So super cute. If you look at the bottom, you'll see the key. That's essentially blue, blue ones are healthy, yellow are exposed, and red are infectious. All right. And on the bottom right hand side of the screen over here, you'll actually see where it is. Um, let's see, it's actually time scales at one. So they can speed this thing up. We can speed up to 100 times speed in the emulate, in the actual Unity game environment itself. <clears throat> OK, and so that goes on. Uh, and the checkout, the checkout counters are up here at the top. Okay, so there are the aisles over here and the checkout counters are up at the top. So this is kind of nifty because once you got it working, you can, you can multiply it on the cloud and run thousands of instances thousands of times and get millions of iterations that all feed to the same data output. And this is what that looks like here. So one of the data outputs was just a bar chart showing the exposure rate. And notice what, what they're trying to say here is a high level. They're trying to say um, registers, number of registers, the more registers you have, uh, the more you minimize the exposure rate. Obviously, the more effective people you have, you're going to maximize the exposure rate. So this is kind of a neat little thing that plays out in the output of this data uh, is that the number of registers really helps. The next one, it shows the number of shoppers here, 20, 30, and 40 shoppers starting out, and their exposure rates as you open up the number of registers right here. So it actually went down. Basically, I guess the idea here is don't let don't make people wait in line at the checkout and they won't get sick. And then the last one also showed a comparison of two-way aisles and one-way aisles. And essentially, 
one way and two outs really didn't have much of an impact on the number of shoppers that got exposed. It's so kind of a charming little demonstration of data coming out from a simulation. Okay, so now we're gonna switch over to ML Agents. And uh, if you haven't heard of it, it's free and open source. You can download it, run it in Unity. You guys know that Unity environment's free to download too. Um, it's a toolkit that lets you work with um, micro machine learning. There's a bunch of reference little projects here you can get started on that will allow you to, uh, to see how it works. Like these guys, these little cubes are trying to balance a ball in their head. Um, there's one over here for playing soccer and the agents learn how to play soccer. So the variety you can check into, it's not hard. You basically get some basics on how, how MLA uh, works. Um, it's open source, okay? It's the, you know, in the top open source project for AI and deep learning. It's got 10,000 stars on GitHub and 100 plus academic paper and citations. And here's a link to that down below. So you can get that and try it out for yourself. I'm gonna show you Hummingbirds today. It basically goes to a bit more of a thorough training about ML agents. If you know a little bit about Unity, you'll be fine. Uh, this gentleman, Adam Kelly, walks you through all the pieces, setting everything up and the logic behind it. It's a really good exercise. Uh, if you know Unity really well, you'll breeze through it pretty quickly. If you don't know it that way, it might take you, you know, two or three, two or three days to get through it. But it's excellent. It's also free because learning Unity is free. You can get the course right there. But I'm going to alt tab over and show that. Uh, we're doing good on time, so maybe I'll, we'll do a whole questions until the end uh, so that I can, go th I can get through this one first. All right, so let me, let me get out of this for a moment and switch over to Hummingbirds. Okay, and uh, Zarella, can you see my, um, let's see, I'm going to get the Unity environment up. Hang on. There we go. Can you see the Unity environment? Yeah, maybe if you could just make it a little big. Because it's small for me, but I'm on a big monitor, so I don't know for the others. Okay. Yeah, that'd be fine. So I'm not sure if I can actually, I can't zoom in the, the text on, on the environment, but that's okay. I'll be able to do it in Visual Studio and it really counts. Okay. So what, what's going on here, let me just kind of zoom out a little bit, is this is the training environment. So you guys remember how first thing we did was we, we trained up the, the little brain, the, the um, file that we're going to spit out. This thing... What you do is you're gonna set up a little hummingbird to go and suck nectar out of flowers in a training environment. It's gonna run for a whole bunch of times. It's gonna spit out a little inference file, a .nm file. And the, then you take that .nm file and you stick it back into the game environment and it runs a bird for you that you compete against. So let me see if I can first show you just what that looks like up close. Let me go grab one of these little hummingbirds here and I'll show you an example. So here he is, or here she is. And it's got some sensors there. It's got some ray casting that it's doing so it understands its world. And then you wire in an environment, you wire in access to it, and then there's a little um, CS file, which we're gonna look at here in just a moment. That's one piece. You get that, the assets are all there in the tutorial, and he'll walk you through setting that up. The flowers are already being placed, and you'll set it up on one island. Then once you have it working on one island, you'll scale it out to many islands. That's how you can scale it inside the system on your computer. All right. So again, let me find my little hummingbird since I left him. I left her. And his goal, his, his goal is essentially find those flowers. And let me see if I can just go find a flower. I said flowers real quick here. Flowers. Okay. Yeah, get in there. There we are. So all the flowers are are, are set up. Oh, I see. Let me back out a little bit here. Sorry guys. Okay, so the flowers are all set up to um, give nectar. That's kind of their main goal. And you can see the whole arrangement here. There's bushes, there's trees. It can run into things, and it's got a big box around it to keep it from leaving the island. <coughs> keep it from leaving the island. And so he's going to have sensors in there with colliders and stuff that'll keep him from leaving the island. And then he's, the idea is he, get dropped, he gets dropped in a random place, and then he finds his way to the flowers. And then... The way, the way ML Agents works is actually just a little folder. I'll kind of show you. It's just a part of Humming of the Hummingbirds project. And it, the technology is in here and you set it up and you run a command line interface. And that's actually the one for TensorBoard. So here's the one for uh, ML Agents. So <clears throat> you're encouraged to download Anaconda to manage all your versions of Python and run in the Anaconda environment. All this is, is gone over in that tutorial. 
And once you've got it set up, you essentially run this ML agents learn command. You, you provide a configuration file, which is this little trainer config YAML file. And let me open up that just so you can see what it looks like. It's got some basically some parameters that you can tweak and uh, how long the batch sizes are because it learns in batches. A variety of things here you can change. You don't really need to change anything out of the box though. That's kind of the point is that that just kind of works for you. And later when you want to get into this, you can go in and learn about some of these parameters that you want to change. Okay, so that's a part of the little uh, project right there. And you also then say you got to give it a run. You, you say I'm going to start running and you, you can run different um, different in, uh, runs of it because you may change some parameters and want to keep that runs results. I have one that's been in progress because I want to show you what it looks like first once it's been running a while because it can take hours on a computer to get some decent progress. So I'm going to show you what it looks like to run uh, a resumed version which you just tag it with the resume over here and uh, and then I'm going to run unity so you can see what it looks like. So get that going. It's waiting now. It's, it's communicating. Hold on, I'm got a space in there. there go. <laughs> Sorry, let's see here. I resumed it earlier today. I... Okay, cool. Now it's hanging out and waiting. And then we'll go over here and it tells you to start the little button. So I just hit play. So we're gonna go back here and I'm gonna run the environment. I've got, I've got eight agents running right now. So eight of them are all running and they're all feeding the same file, the same TensorFlow file. So I'm gonna go to my scene and you can see um, if I go and select more of these guys here, they're all running and they're all actually doing their learning and feeding that same file. There's another one over there. So they're all actually doing their thing. And they're all feeding one file. And then they all kind of dump some information here. They got stuff going on and they get rewards. And once it gets above zero, they're getting some good stuff. They're getting some nectar. As I mentioned earlier, I ran this one for about two hours earlier today because I wanted you to see what success looks like once they've got a little training. So we're gonna go over here to this guy and see what he's doing. Now, I'm actually running at super fast speeds. So let me take a moment and slow it down. I got it at 20, you go up to 100. I'm gonna drop it down to one. Okay, so now he's doing his little scanning and he's finding his way to this flower. And he actually looks pretty savvy here. Sorry, I'll stop moving it. He's trying to figure his way out now. He's just kind of maturely getting a little bit savvier at how to get nectar out of this flower. This is gonna been running for a couple of hours. He's probably got two or three million iterations under his belt right now or under her belt. And the, the flowers turn purple, in case you couldn't tell. They turn purple when all the nectar's gone. They start out red. And you can see it's sensing where it's at. It's sensing that it's near the flower. The green line is indicating it's seen the, the closest flower and it's trying to zero in on how to get its beak into that flower. Once it does, it drinks some nectar and then it turns. The scenario just reset. It actually runs out of time. This is part of training. It'll reset the scenario because it's better for the agents to learn after a while. So they run out of time and then they get reset. So all these agents are doing that. This looks nice and healthy. Now I'm gonna show you how we visualize the data. And then once I show you that, I'm gonna kind of move back in time, so to speak, and run a brand new scenario so that you can see what it looks like when the agent has no clue as to what it's doing. It actually has a decent clue right now. Okay. so. We have another command uh, window here, and this is for TensorBoard. It's running, it's been running. It basically uh, launches a network server or a, um, a web host, and you got a little local host, and it can show you what the data looks like. So here, this is what it looks like. This is TensorBoard running at the local host, and let me bring up this particular instance. So what we're looking at right now is, let me refresh it. I think we're looking at this one because I resume. I think I had a typo when I tried to run that one. Let's go here. And the pink one's currently getting worked on. So it's around almost 2 million, maybe 1.8 million iterations. And it's got some pretty savvy stuff. And the early, early iterations, it's just it's randomly doing stuff. No idea. I run this about five times. You just change the name. And you can see that as they get somewhere around 2.5 million to 3 million, they start leveling out. 
and they get around 25 flowers of nectar before they run out of time. That's kind of how this tensor board viewer works. And as I said earlier, we're looking at this scenario here. So let me kind of clear that out. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to reset it because I want you to see what it looks like with a brand new agent. And then we can look at the code. All right, so let me go here. And so I actually had to hit, hit, hit stop. I'm going to stop that. Let's see if it's actually stopped for me yet. Hmm. Come on, Unity. That's a good subject. I may have to kill Unity. This is unusual. I don't have anything on Visual Studio. Now, I'll tell you what, let's give Unity a moment. I'd rather not kill it because it takes a lot of reload. Let me bring up Visual Studio and I'll show you the script. This right here, and I'll zoom in on the text so you guys can actually see what it is, is the actual Hummingbird script, the Hummingbird agent that gets applied to the little hummingbird that's in the environment. It is using ML agents and the sensors, because we do have a couple of sensors there that it's using. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and it's got a bunch of tooltips and stuff. But um, essentially, there's a few interesting functions that I want you to see. One is on episode begin. It'll reset the flowers. This is when it runs out of time and it starts over. Reset the flowers. It gets all the rigid bodies and stuff reset. It finds the, the nearest flower and then it gets randomized and then it finds the nearest flower. So that just gets dropped in there somewhere and it moves to a spot that makes sense for it. And then it, um, it finds the nearest flower and that's how it starts out. The way reinforcement learning works is it is given some parameters it can control to try things out and then it's given um, a reward if it's successful towards the goal or a negative reward if, it, if it's failing, if it's not doing the right stuff that we want it to do. The way we handle that is we give it an on action received call. This function is actually used in two ways. You can either one, use it in the game uh, as if heuristics is turned on, and I'll show you that in a minute, um, to control it. So in the end, we're gonna compete with the, vec with the hummingbird, to see, hummingbird to see if we can actually beat it to getting nectar done first, filling our bellies full of nectar. Um, but what it's also done is it gets a chance to, to be told by the machine learning agent, the system that's running over here in, um, in the command line prompt, to, to try this out, try that out, try this out, try this out. And it's controlling a few things. It's, it's controlling the location. So it actually gets moved to a location. It's, it's controlling the pitch and the yaw, which is basically, is it tipping forward or backward? Is it rotating right or left? So those are the three things that it changes and height. It can hit all six dimensions there. And then it goes. And they'll try it out. And then it collects observations. So this is part of the, the ML agents class. And it does an observation. The observation that it does is, is it close enough? And does it need to make some changes? Uh, it says, is it actually tipping? It does a dot product to see if it's tipping its beak into the front of the flower. Because that's a, the, the better the angle, the, the more of a chance it has of getting the nectar that's important is actually the angle. Then the heuristic stuff is about driving it with your mouse. So, you know, you use the mouse keys, you, excuse me, not your mouse, but you use the arrow keys and, and the uh, WASD keys to, to navigate, which we'll look at in a, in a moment. Um, but I want to see the rewards here. That's the important part. So here's the rewards. All right, if it's in training mode, there's a little flag you flip in Unity for the training mode. Is this thing actually done yet? I think Unity's crashed. Let me take a moment and, and kill Unity and restart it. I don't know why it would have posed like that. Give me one second.
Okay, we'll, we'll restart Unity and while we're, while we're looking at the code, we can restart Unity. Once it's done. Okay, so um, the reward system is that it will, it, will get a, it will get a little bit of a bonus if it's getting nectar. This little if statement says, yes, I'm getting some nectar. And if it's getting nectar, it gets just a little bit of bonus. Yay for you. But it also gets rewarded if the angle is, is better. If it's actually pointing as big down inside, it gets a little bit more of a bonus. So there's a little variation there. Yeah. We, we lost your uh, text editor. Oh, darn. Okay. Let me stop yeah. sharing. Thank you. Let me stop sharing and reshare. Thank you for catching me there. What okay. do you guys see? We can see it now. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so I was, uh, let me back up and look at the reward one more time. So this is the code that does the rewarding. It basically will give a little bit of a bonus if it's actually getting nectar. This is the whole thing about getting nectar. This function is getting nectar. So um, if we're coming inside, we see that we're in the flower and we're getting nectar as received. And if we get some, then we go in and we get a little bonus for getting some of that nectar. Or, or we get a basic bonus of 0.01F. It's all normalized to one and negative one. And we get a little bit of a bonus if the tip of the beak is inside the flower. So that's a reward. And if we run out of nectar, because eventually they drain, then we leave. All right. There's also a negative reward. We have colliders, which if you're familiar with Unity, you know, you put these colliders on this, you know, when some, when game objects are actually touching each other. If it runs into the boundary, we don't want it flying off of the island on accident. So we do teach it don't fly off of the island, and we give it a negative reward. Again, it's normalized to negative one right there. And so this is like half negative reward. So that way we keep it from doing crazy stuff and, and getting out of its world. Okay, so that's essentially how it will go about getting rewards and also changing its world and trying again. And it's this iteration loop that actually trains it. All right. Let me see if I can bring Unity back up here with Hummingbirds around again. For some reason, my computer is running this down like crazy, so I thought Unity was already running. All right, there's also, I want to show you one other thing here, which is kind of neat. You can, yeah, so you can actually um, set this thing up to navigate as well for the game. And that's what we do here. We've got basically hotkeys in there for that, for competing. And I think the rest of it is just talking about the basic variable. So I guess that's pretty much it for the script. Oh good, it's back up and running now. Okay, so let it recapture. This is actually the, this is the gaming environment. So I wanna show you guys, not the, not the one where it's done yet. Let's go into the scenes. And I wanna show you the hummingbird um, which I'm going to go back to the trainer because I want to show you what it looks like when the when the agents are um, when they're brand new. So I go back to uh, this one. Oh, I see. It's there. We go. It's finally timed out. Okay. So I'm going to run a new instance instead of running the trainer for HBO five with a resume command. I'm going to do six. So crank up ML agents. It's happy and waiting. We'll come over here. Okay. And I'll hit play. If you're familiar with the basics of reinforcement learning, this won't surprise you. But if you're not, you'll see some really interesting little behavior here as it goes. We'll go up to the scene, find one of my hummingbirds, zoom in on it. Or she's refinding. Okay. So here's what he's just randomly trying stuff. He really doesn't know what's going on. This, the, 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 the system doesn't know it's a hummingbird. It has things it can control. Again, up and down, left and right, direction from the flower, and it's just randomly trying stuff. And it's clearly not getting any nectar, and it won't get any nectar for a while. It's just gonna sit here, try, try, try. So I'm gonna crank it up to 100, and it'll start going really fast, and the screen's not gonna be able to keep up with it. It's moving so fast. But we're getting many more iterations out of it now this way. And then if you go over to the tensor board, I'm going to refresh tensor board. This should be an HBO six. There it is. And it's in the very early days of, of it trying out of stuff. We're not even at 10,000 iterations yet. 
Uh, but what you can see is in the very early, early days, they're gonna fail forever. They're not gonna get any flowers before the timer runs out. Fail, 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 fail. Then they'll get lucky and get lucky and they'll start to figure out what's going on until they actually become mature. That's how this reinforcement learning works. It's for trial and error, just like we as animals trial and error and we learn whether or not the stove is hot by touching it. And we realize we don't want that negative reward anymore. All right, so he's trying. That's what it looks like. I went backwards because it's much easier for you to see where it's gone um, and then see how random it is to begin with. I'm now gonna switch over and we're almost done, we're almost done with everything here. I'm not gonna switch over and show you the game. So you can see end to end what happens. Let's go back to scenes. This is the actual game experience. There's a UI, a simple UI and one environment. And TensorFlow should be done. It timed out, okay. So let's run this thing for a second. Actually, before I run it, I should tell you one other piece of information. What happens is all that work leads to the generation of these NN files. Hummingbird.nn, that is actually the data file that's worked so hard to make. You take that, you bring it into, you bring it into Unity as a data file. And when you look at your agents, you'll see floating island, uh, opponent, which is the, which is the uh, hummingbird. Come on. Yeah, uh, the hummingbird. If you look over in the inspector here, you will see the agent um, has actually been given an, an inference file. That the same inference file that I showed you earlier is applied to the agent here. And uh, I'm trying to remember where it's at. That's one thing I didn't refresh my memory on before uh, jumping in here. Uh, there it is, NN model right there. So that's the file. They just drag it on there. And now it knows the world and it can use that to infer and make decisions. And it's actually really good. It's much better than I am at getting honey, uh, or excuse me, nectar, because the, the navigation's tough in this, in this game. That's one thing about the tutorial I think could be improved is navigation could be a lot easier. And that's something you could do. You can improve the navigation if you have time. But I'll show you how quickly it makes me look bad. So we start it off, and we go to the game. Let's see, go to the game interface here, and start. And I'm gonna see if I can, I can actually move my bird around. It's actually so fast. Oh, I know it's so fast. Let me turn the timing back down to one. Okay, real time now. And play, and start, okay. So I've got WASD keys here, and I can go and try to find my, find me a flower. But see over there, there's the guy over there. He's, he's actually crushing it already. I wanna go see what this guy's doing, you can see. He's already eating flowers much faster than I am. So I'm gonna go in here and try my best to beat him. I will fail because I can't, I can't fly my little bird very well. Hey pal, I want that one. And you can see up in the top here, he's already halfway full, I've got nothing. So let me see if I can actually get to one of these flowers before he does. I probably won't because I'm terrible at navigating this little, this little guy. Let's see here. Mm. Yeah, I can't, I can't get to him. There's one. I'll try that one. Mm. I gotta go down to. Yeah. Oh, hey, pal. So he's getting my nectar. So he's zipping it on. He's going to beat me in a second and it starts all over. So that's essentially the end to end ecosystem that you can create for your game if you want to train up an agent to be really savvy. Now let me stop that. That's the tutorial there. And now we're gonna switch back to the slides. I think I'm kind of done. Uh, let's see if there's anything else. Uh, just a quick thank you for some of the images that I use from the internet. And why don't we open up for questions now? There's a couple in the chat. Uh, okay. One from Mol Moltava. I think I'm probably saying it wrong, but can you see it on the chat? Let me see here. Should be able to, I saw it earlier. Uh, There's two questions, I believe. I moved the chat window off my screen because I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be sitting at the bottom. Oh, I can read it. No, why don't you do that, help me out. Okay, yeah. so it says question for Chris. How well are you seeing synthetic, <laughs> Can you say that word? Synthetically generated label data in Unity works in the real world. For example, in case of autonomous cars, 
the labeled data is supposed to capture the reactions of the drivers in various situations. However, the synthesized data generated within Unity cannot demonstrate such information. It's an excellent, excellent question. Um, the, the thing that is challenging in the real world is that it's hard to capture a lot of those reactions. So if you're, if you're simulating, if you have a, a wreck, more than likely no one's going to be there to capture that reaction when it happens. Um, so there's a lot of effort to create that in the real world to begin with. With a simulated scenario, you can actually program up those reactions. And you can randomize them a little bit and recreate and recreate and recreate different wreck scenarios and different emotions if you want to use the drivers in that scenario uh, to simulate a, and synthesize the data necessary to get enough unusual situations to train your model. Uh, a good example is just uh, if, you're, if you're, your car is sitting and you see people crossing the street, you can simulate people crossing the street all day long in a bunch of different ways, different speeds, different sizes, with dogs, without animals, all these kinds of things. And make that very dynamic and get much closer than you can uh, than you can in the real world because you can just iterate thousands and thousands of times. So you can, there is always the challenge to, to close that real world gap from simulation. But you have the ability to do a lot more in simulation than you can in reality. Here's a great example. You know, John and I are, are from the, the, the DOD world where they need to be able to simulate a battle with things exploding and damaging stuff in the environment. So if you run a drone over an environment and you scan the environment and you bring that in, now you can run simulation after simulation with real damage to the, uh, to the meshes. You can drop bombs it'll damage the mesh and all sorts of ways that you really can't simulate in reality. Then you can train your agents with that environment because you're able to simulate so much more unusual events that you can't simulate in the real world. So I would actually say that you can do a really good job of capturing various pieces of information that you can't normally get. Reactions would have to be something that you'd have to program into. It's just another way to, to, to simulate the environment. <coughs> Okay, I can now see the question, so I'll, Zarela, I can read the next one. Okay, all right, let's see. Was this service, this is from Joanna, was this service working with Structure Core? I ordered a core when it first came out because it was supposed to work with Unity. Unfortunately, the company did not make it available to its users. Is this something that will be available to use now? Uh, Joanna, I don't know what Structure Core is. If you'd like to chime in and explain to me what that is, be happy to uh, speak to it. It's just, uh, like you said, it's a, um, a fusion of sensors. It has, uh, um, uh, I'm blanking, uh, IR, uh, just regular RGB camera, depth sensors, um, probably even like, a, um, I cannot think right now, a gyroscope, uh, just all the different sensors to get positional data as well as visual data. Now they said they had, um, and this was like two or three years ago, perception um, was their, it was like the uni perception. And I don't think that was public back then, was it? Probably not, because the AI okay. team is only four years old. So Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, so how, how, how involved are um, like um, the APIs or the, the, the interface to um, uh, hardware right now? It's really, I'm glad you asked that question because um, I'll actually want to draw a distinction between package that you can install into Unity right now, which mm -hmm. gives you access to all sorts of stuff on your phone, right? You've got the accelerometer and the camera, sure. and all this, right? So that sensor package you can get now and has a lot access to a lot of the stuff you'd find on a mobile phone. Um, sensor SDK, in my opinion, should be called sensor emulation SDK because it is about emulating it in the environment in Unity, sure. not in reading data from the outside world. Okay. You follow? So I think the sensor, the sensor package that's online is pretty user friendly from what I've seen. Sure. The, um, the sensor SDK for emulating, emulating sensors, it, there's more work. But it is really cool in that we have a system graph and you'll be able to pull these emulators into a system graph and wire them up visually okay. as opposed to having to write the code to do that. That's one of the value adds that we're bringing with the sensor emulation SDK. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Oh, uh, great. Okay. Um, Let's see here. Are there any other questions? Do we have anything else? No question. 
Yes. Um, you were doing something during the presentation and having to do with Python. I, I didn't quite catch it. And I know a lot of the code is in C sharp. Can you do this purely in Python or other languages? Oh, I see what you're asking. Let me get the, uh, the, um, the Hummingbird tutorials and someone asked about that. Uh, so the Python part is used in ML and the ML agent engine. And uh, let's see, Unity. So here is the Hummingbird tutorial. I'll drop that in the chat. It's also part of the deck, but let me drop it into the chat real quick to get that question answered. Okay, so um, the, the actual ML agent technology that's running here, that is in Python. And they chose that because a lot of the um, reinforcement learning work is done in Python. The actual implementation and your usage in Unity is C Sharp. So that's still C Sharp. When you're wiring your agents into the class, um, you're using a C Sharp class to interface with the Python um, ML system. <clears throat> Does that clarify the question? The yeah, right? Python runs your local web server and that's, that's, that's it, right? Not the web server. It, 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 I mean, it, it does actually run a web server, true. But it also runs the ML agent technology that's building. This is based on TensorFlow, which is uh, got a Python interface. And we also have one for PyTorch, which we've recently announced. This is running, you know, on, on Google TensorFlow here on the back end. So it's using a Python um, uh, interface to talk to Google's TensorFlow and make these tensor files. But the actual, so you won't be touching any of the things inside the ML agents code. You would be touching here the actual access to the library inside as a package inside Unity, but a C sharp. Does that kind of answer your question? It does. Thanks very much. Yeah. Sorry for the, the lack of clarity there as I was blitzing through things. Yeah. All good. Okay. Other questions that I might have missed? Anything else? Okay. One question. On a high level, is the current goal of AI to create a baseline or standard and utilizing humans to design the specifics? For example, I've heard of aesthetic engines that carry a large amount of art for a competition and throws out a lot of submitted work. From there, judges make the final calls. Um, I would say this is, a, this is a more advanced version of expert systems from back in the day. You know, expert system concept is you have a really savvy amount of data and processing that the computer can do, but it does inform a human to make final decisions. I think that that is one use, absolutely one use that we are seeing in projects that are coming our way to help operators of some console make a much more informed decision because they can process all this data that's coming at them since we have, you know, billions of bits of data coming at us every day to process all that noise and make some intelligent recommendations so that the human can make a final decision. Absolutely. I'm not, I, can, I, I can't speak about the project. There's at least one we're dealing with right now that does that human um, human computer expert system that you've described here, Brian. Uh, yeah, I would say that is true. It's not the only use of AI, but it is one effective use of AI. How is you, so now, um, uh, I guess it's Mataba. Uh, how is Unity plan to connect to ROS? Are you going to release a plugin that does that? Well, we have uh, this, I believe already, we have customers that are using it. I'm hoping it's already out. <clears throat> Let's find out. Yeah, see here, connecting ROS to Unity. So it's actually already available, and I can put you in contact with those folks if you want to learn more about what's being done in the ROS uh, community with Unity 3D. I talk with them every week. If you want to learn more, just email me and say, hey, what are the information? What's the information here? I'll be happy to get you onto the forums and directly with that team. Okay. All right, other questions? Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mutaba. Okay, let me, let's see, we're right here about four minutes. We'll hang on another minute. I'll stop sharing. And uh, we'll see if anyone has any further questions. Okay, and if not, um, why don't we go ahead and I can turn it back over to you guys to wrap up the meeting. Thank Wait. you so much. Well, more just came in. <laughs> oh, great, perfect, okay, let's see. Uh, what about any effort on improving rendering with AI? Game graphics. 
Oh, interesting, interesting. There's two things I can think of off the top of my head. Uh, the first is we do have Art Engine. In fact, at the end of the deck, I let's see, did I mention anything on the deck? I have a link on the questions tab. You can look and see all the different products that we have. One of them is called Art Engine. It actually does use AI to inform making the art better. So check out Art Engine. I'll send you the deck. Um, actually, maybe I can just find it real quick and put it in here. Minty Art Engine, so you guys can see what that's about. Uh, yes, here. Okay, take this. Have a look at it. If you have further questions, let me know. I can, I can put you in contact with the people. <clears throat> now, uh, about improving game graphics. You might, if you haven't heard of it, Unity also has a physically based uh, rendering engine called HDRP. That is, it makes gorgeous green game graphics, okay? The, the universal rendering pipeline is for making it easy to get great AAA quality graphics into your mobile games and that kind of stuff. But if you really want high definition rendering or physics based rendering, check out HDRP. It's a different workflow. You can start out that way from the Unity Hub. You can choose an HDRP based game because it's a different workflow, but that really improves game graphics as well. But you can also check out Art Engine if you want to look at it even earlier in the pipeline. I just want to say that I, uh, I'm now redoing my app um, in Universal Render Pipeline, and you can see the graphic, how crisp it is, so much, much more better than without it. The shadows, everything looks so beautiful. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. It does, and, and that's something we come up uh, uh, a lot that comes up in our conversations. There are at least two video trailers out there where they've done these beautiful rendering, storytelling, little like a seven-minute film uh, in HDRP. It is just just amazing. So um, maybe I can find one while we're chatting. I'll drop one of the videos in here, but if not, be, follow with me after. I'll be happy to give you a copy. All right, let's see. Um, Oh, so jo Johanna says, is that using forward or deferred rendering, or is this a new pipeline? It's actually, um, it's on the fly. This is in the rendering engine on the fly. It's not delayed. It's not like on a farm or something that you do overnight just for film. It is, it is, um, it's a real-time rendering engine using high-definition render pipeline. Is that yeah, I question? mean, forward and deferred are both real-time. I was just wondering if it was piggybacking off of one of those compositional. Oh, I see. I don't know the answer there. Okay. With you. I'm not a technical artist enough to give you an educated answer. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, use HDRP uh, video. Let's see if I can quickly find one of those really cool HDRP videos. Um, I'll tell you what I'll do. I bet that I'll do it listed here. So we can just drop this into the chat. You guys can look at the videos that they've created. Okay. okay. I think some cut an answer for it. <laughs> There you go. ERP uses forward render. There you go. Thank you, Sam. Okay, and thanks also, Kishore, you mentioned NVIDIA using DLSS. Okay, that's news too. All right, other questions for us, for me? I guess just out of curiosity, I don't mean to take up any more time, is like uh, you are directly working for Unity in Orlando? That's right. Okay. All right, um, and then you guys are tailored more towards, is it, is it just specifically AR, um, the Unity Perception Engine side of it, or do you have like a specific target? I know you said you work with a lot of uh, military sim um, in the area. I was just curious if you can elaborate a little bit more. Yeah, sure. Uh, John and I and the team that we're building in Unity are focused on industrial support and military support. There's a big uh, military simulation hub here in Orlando. All the major forces of the military are here and they all have some sort of simulation needs. But we also have companies like Siemens that have major simulation needs too. So initially it's a lot of Department of Defense and government work, MIT, uh, Space Force, that kind of stuff. But then it's also growing out past that uh, to any industrial needs, that, you know, from training of robots and that kind of stuff. So. We are enabling basically any, any enterprise level, industrial customer, military customer that needs to get to AI solutions, scaling, simulation, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, we're enabling them to get onto Unity or to take what they have in Unity and, and push it to those solutions. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. well, we've got a team of um, six or seven people here. We're looking to get up to 10 to 15 by the summertime next year or something like that. So. Okay, thanks. 
Do you do any uh, collaboration with uh, local businesses or anything like that? Is it just purely building that team and um, uh, just maintaining client clientele through Unity? Uh, collaboration in what sense? Uh, just running events and whatnot. Like I, 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 for the past year, taught at Full Sail in the art art game department. Um, but I was just wondering, like, if you do events um, and and different things like that, and so how you have business relationships with other companies. I see. Uh, certainly you are right. It's, it's more at this point because it's a young team really focused on building business um, and solving problems that way. I think our, at the moment, our networking arm is the augmented reality VR, um, the AR VR association that John runs. And so Unity is a big part of that because of who John is and who I am. Uh, but you know, Unity is a very cult culturally rich, uh, responsible company that cares about culture. And so as the presence grows, and we have a real foothold here. I see that being a big part of what we do. Yeah. Okay, any other questions, gang? How nervous were you on Shark Tank? <laughs> <laughs> I was I was very nervous. Yes, it was um, it was it was fun and exciting and awkward. Uh, but it was it was one of the coolest experiences I've had. Did you get funded? The, yeah, well, we got a what's called a handshake deal with um, um, uh, uh, Kerjavec, Robert Herjavec. Um We got a handshake deal. Oftentimes, what happens is behind the scenes when the teams get back together with with you know the, the business team and the investor, they have to really get aligned to make that investment like any other investment. We did not get aligned, and so we did not get investment. Which season? Uh, uh, seven, I want to say. Seven or 12, something like that. It's about um, five or six years ago now. Yeah. All right, other questions? Awesome. Thank you so much, Grace. Okay. Uh, it really means a lot to us that you were able to take the time to do this presentation for us. Um, Thank you. Yeah, and uh, will will you share uh, with us your deck? I will. I'll share, it, I'll share it on our Slack group. So if anybody wants to be on our Slack, please send me a direct message, and I send your link. And I' gonna let Derek wrap it up. Hey everybody, um, my name is Derek. I'm co-organizer of the Southwest Florida Coders group that were. Uh, that helped put this event on. I got on a little late, so I beg your pardon. Um, we're uh, sponsored in sort um, by JetBrains. JetBrains makes uh, some great products for developers, uh, namely IDEs and code editors. Um, and they're uh, nice enough to give us um, a year's license uh, to raffle out to our group um, for every meetup group or meetup we do. So um, I have a fun little script. Uh, that I run and in front of everyone that will show uh, whoever won, it'll pick someone randomly um, who won the, uh, the license. Um, one thing I do ask is if you are chosen and you don't think you're going to activate the license, please let me know because they'll stop giving them to us if people don't activate them. So um, uh, I don't know if you feel comfortable saying out loud, like I'm not interested or or whatever, so, uh, or you can message me directly and, and, um, and uh, what's this called, Zoom here. Okay, great. I'm gonna look, figure out how to share my screen. There you go. Okay. Wonderful, can you see my screen? Good, move some stuff around here. Okay, uh, here we go. Move that over there. Good luck, everybody. Are we good? You can still see it? Okay, here we go, big moment. Christopher V, oh, he left. And I updated the list, but I forgot to save the darn file. All right, hold on a second, let's run it again. <laughs> Plus, he won last time, I think. Yeah. 
Yeah. 